Okay. Okay. I don't want to accidentally touch it. Can people hear me? Okay. What a time to be alive. Um, thank you all for coming to my presentation. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, this has been research that I've been um, thinking about working on for the last year or two. Um, and, and just to get things started, um, really the point of this presentation is to convince you all, the audience, um, that emotional intelligence and the understanding of human behavior makes for better technical people, right? We can become better red team operators and we, be and we, be we can become um, better penetration testers if we understand behavioral science. There's not really a need to, to constantly reinvent the wheel. Um, so here's the, the, classic, the classic slide of who am I? Um, and this is going to be kind of a theme throughout the presentation because um, who I am, um, to convince you guys to, to listen to me about the red teaming stuff, um, I'm a consultant at SpectreOps. Um, I primarily focus on red teaming, adversary simulation, um, network penetration testing, and, and kind of everything under that um, umbrella. I have a background in incident response, but um, that's not really been my focus uh, the last year or two. I've been consulting for about three years and working at SpectreOps for one, and it's always kind of been under this broad um, adversary simulation uh, type of work. Um, I'm also a behavioral science enthusiast. I say enthusiast because I'm definitely not an expert. Um, I, I read a lot of books and I, I mean, I, I really enjoy taking my abstract ideas, um, from the, the behavioral science books and being, a, being able to apply them to my red team operations. That's what gets me really excited about going to work. Um, and it's, it's, the constant, I have a hypothesis, and then I can go test it and see, is this actually applicable to other domains? And I wouldn't be giving this presentation if I came to the conclusion that um, it's not relevant. Guess what it is? Certain themes are pervasive across humanity, um, and, and we can learn a lot from them. Um, and, and one thing that I've really been thinking about a lot, especially the past year, is computers take on the biases of their owners, right? Um, but what does that mean for us as red teamers? What does that mean for adversary simulation? Because if computers take on the biases of their owners, then that means that all of my, my free time spent reading these books is relevant. I can take the same type of um, attack vectors or the same exploitation techniques and see if they apply to the underlying principles of how we exploit stuff. Um, one thing that I, I want to start off with is who I'm not, um, just to make sure that um, everyone here is, is here for the right reason. When I submitted this talk uh, back in March, I, I thought of myself as a social engineer, and I realized that that was the best social engineering I ever did. Like the biggest, the biggest um, social engineering job I did was to convince myself that I'm a social engineer because I look different. And you know what, that's not a really good reason to, to, to be a social engineer. A social engineer has a lot of different characteristics. Um, actually, yesterday, I, I went over to the social engineering village, and I asked a few people, okay, what makes a strong social engineer? And um, I loved the first answer, because it was concise, and the answer was empathy. And now I'm starting to doubt whether I'm a social engineering wizard or not, because I like to think I'm empathetic, but there's a continuous doubt that I have about all of my strengths and my weaknesses. Um, I'm also not a security expert. I don't think I'm a social engineering expert, and I definitely don't think I'm a security expert. But there's a lot of power to be able to say that I am not an expert in, in something. Um, I, I think that being an expert gets in the way of our drive to seek out the truth, right? We get seduced into thinking that we know what, what is going on, when really we, we might not and that overconfidence is what we are exploiting in, in security systems. It's what we're exploiting um, when we're interacting with people. And it's something to be very skeptical of. Um, I, I'm giving a presentation right now um, with things that will go into stuff like Windows authentication. And just looking at the crowd, I know there's people out there that know more about this than I do. I know that, um, that in this crowd there's people that know more about behavioral science. But... The reason why I'm giving this talk is because of my ability to connect the dots. And I think that's something that I am an expert in. Um, so another who am I slide. More than anything, I'm a product of my community. Um, I graduated from the University of Miami about three years ago. 
And um, I wouldn't be here if I didn't surround myself with great people and follow great people on Twitter. Um, probably the most relevant um, pieces of work to, to this presentation uh, would be a, an ace up the sleeve by Will Schrader, Andy Robbins, and Lee Christensen, um, and security professionals, the, the plumbers of, uh, of trust from Peter um, Kopta. Um, and that was from a 2012 um, Troopers conference. And then on the behavioral science side, it's Daniel Kahneman, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. That was actually my, my first introduction to behavioral science. Um, a, a college professor suggested that I, re I read it. Um, and then uh, Nassim Nic Nicholas Taleb's book, Fooled by Randomness, and also Algorithms to Live By, um, by Brian Christian and Tom Griffiths. So I think that all of us sitting here are just products of our community, right? We're all learning from each other, and we're taking the knowledge of the people that we're surrounded with, and we're building on those ideas, right? It's that constant improvement. And for me, I, I hope that the next time I give a conference talk, I have even more extremely influential pieces, um, particularly probably from those um, in this crowd. Uh, so this talk title is called Practical Heuristic Exploitation. And the first thing I want to get across is that heuristics are not bad, right? It, it sounds bad from the title, but heuristics, they're not good or bad, they just are, right? Heuristics is something that humanity has learned to deal with. And we have to deal with it because we're making so many decisions every day. We want to be able to think fast. Um, to define a heuristic, which um, probably not all of you know what a heuristic is, it's mostly just a mental shortcut or an algorithmic shortcut. So we don't always need to be perfect when we're making decisions. Um, especially because we're incentivized by speed, right? So often we'll trade completeness, accuracy, and precision for speed, right? Because we want to be quickly moving forward. We can see this in the way that algorithms um, work. So if you think of a bubble sort, that takes a very long time, and it's pretty inefficient. Or we have quick sort, which is uh, pretty fast for a lot of inputs. But regardless of if it's a person thinking about um, what they're going to do that day or how we're setting up our algorithms, we want to incentivize speed or, or um, devs have been incentivized by speed, right? People that create applications are incentivized by speed. We want really quick interactions and we want to be able to connect ideas quickly and we use heuristics to do that. So they're not bad, but because they're not always, always accurate, that means that they can be exploited. Um, so one example I want to give uh, to, to try to give an example of heuristics and, and how we think about them is how we recall a memory. So if you think about what you had for lunch, um, for lunch, I had leftovers from dinner two nights ago. It was awesome. Um, but I, I can't remember what I had for lunch two weeks ago. So things that are really recent stay in our memory, right? Um, and another thing that, that drives how easily is, how easily it is to index a memory is um, things that happened often or things that you've heard often. So um, in ninth grade bio, I learned that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and I still remember that. That's something that still I think about all the time. And that's ridiculous, but it's just because I heard it so many times. Like, right, mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. Um, and also, very interesting things are stuff that I remember, right? Huge um, times of my life, like I remember... Um, getting a, a, a Red Bull vodka spilled on me when um, I was walking to work my fair, I was walking um, to work during my internship. That's a pretty obscure moment when you think about it. It was, it was a few years ago, but it had a large impact on me because it was interesting. And there's ways in computers that we can also see how the same heuristics apply. Um, so at, at a very broad level as well, if we think of browser caching, Right, browser caching is taking advantage of um, temporary storage locations on your computer. Um, it's saving things like HTML, CSS, um, style sheets, JavaScript scripts, images, kind of all that jazz. And, and the point is, is to be able to reduce bandwidth um, on both the user and the server and allow the page to load faster. So browser caching is a broad example, but there's been a few different presentations about things like depopping and how um, saving specific file locations um, can help incentivize speed for credential access. Um, like I've mentioned before, heuristics are to help us 
think really quickly. And to, to give all of you an example of how we're thinking really quickly, we make about 35,000 decisions a day. You all decided to walk into this talk um, thinking that there might be something worth learning out of it, or, or you know me and want to support me. But still, that's a decision. And think about how many decisions led up to that. It's, okay, am I going to be late? Is there another talk that's better? Is there something more relevant to my field? You can also think of how you wake up in the morning, right? Um, when you wake up in the morning and you roll out of bed and you decide what to wear and you decide, am I going to eat breakfast? Will I have tea? Will I have coffee? All these decisions are compounding, right? They keep on adding up. And if we don't automate them, we're not going to ever be able to make a decision. Um, and we use these, these patterns to help us better understand how we're going to automate these decisions. Um, and so, like this slide says, we make 35,000 decisions a day. But I would, I would further that and say we make 35,000 predictions a day. Every decision that we make is a prediction about the future. You guys walked into this talk because you thought it might be worthwhile. Um, well, let's see if it is later on. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but also, when you're waking up in the morning, you're deciding what to wear, you're thinking, this is appropriate for the workplace, or you're going out at night, this is appropriate for this. These are all small predictions, and they're constantly compounding on each other. Um, and these decisions aren't always right. Um, in fact, a lot of times, when we have a little bit more of a complex problem or, or we're thinking really deeply, like when I'm doing math, it, I, I remember whenever I do math because it's, it's hard. Um, or whenever we're doing a new task, we have to think about it a little bit longer. And those are the decisions that we remember from the day, but all of the un unconscious ones, the ones that are below the surface, that's what I want to focus on. It's not the novel stuff, it's what we've automated in our own lives. Um, so, there's, in, in behavioral science, there's a concept of thrashing, right? This is when you have so many decisions going on all the time, and you're constantly being given new information. And I want to point out that more information does not necessarily mean better signal. Um, more information can actually be harmful if you don't have a reason for it. I recently changed my Twitter handle to Kel the Noise because I thought it sounded like Kill the Noise a little bit. Um, and that's because I, I realized how much noise I was inputting all of the time, right? So I want to increase signal without increasing noise because I won't be able to make a decision. During my assessments as a red team operator, I can see myself thrash, right? I join a network at, right after gaining initial access, and I will sometimes get paralyzed by the idea of, there is so much stuff out there. Wow. Okay. Um, what now? Because there's so much to look at. Do I, do I start looking at processes? What processes should I look for? What do I do? And during these times of thrashing, it's important to identify what tools that we have to, better, to, to help us be better operators and to actually move forward. The tool that I use, um, it was created by Will Schrader and Lee Christensen, um, Seatbelt. I go to the experts and I ask them, okay, what do they think is important, um, right? And, and what do they think is actually worth looking into? Seatbelt's a great situational awareness tool and it helps me then start deciding, okay, here is actually what I'm going to start looking at because there are experts who have been looking at this. They think it's important. And if I take what the experts think, think are important, and I start breaking it down of why do they think it's important, I can become a better operator faster. Um, so also uh, on the same kind of lens of thrashing, think about how much data is generated on a network a day. And this goes back into the, the, the signal versus noise um, kind of dilemma of we want, to, we want to be getting all of the alerts. We want to be getting all of the information. But we don't want to get overwhelmed with alert fatigue, right? We want to actually be getting more signal. And, and when we consume less, we can distinguish between relevant and, in, and irrelevant information better. Um, more information can be harmful if there's no reason for it. And this is why I have a lot of sympathy or empathy for incident responders. I think that it must be so difficult to go through hundreds or thousands of alerts of, of things that are malicious activity and figure out, okay, what's really malicious activity? Because I know there must be a, a sub, like a subconscious, um, and even a, a way that they're thinking about it, um, 
and I know that I can exploit that as well, right? If if I want to, I want to be doing the most noise-prone alerts because they're the most likely to overlook those. Um, so the way that we can scale our assumptions are with groups. So um, we group people all the time. So you like stereotyping, that's bad, right? But everyone does it. And we need to do it because we need to be able to group objects into a certain way to be able to advance humanity. And I mean, stereotyping is a very negative example to give, but without groups and, um, and without being able to put people into these um, different areas, we wouldn't be able to move forward as quickly. Like if you're, if you're trying to make a, um, a judgment about a group, that's a lot faster than being able to do it about each individual person. Um, and then in Active Directory, we also use groups. Fun fact. Um, and in groups in Active Directory, uh, system and administrators use them to manage access controls across massive organizations. Without groups and grouping, there is no way that we would actually be able to leverage um, or have any insight into all of the different computer behavior. Um, so as a really quick overview, this is very much oversimplified and we'll dive a lot deeper, but for those of you that aren't familiar with Active Directory, the basic schema is that we have um, users that are members of groups and users have sessions on computers and computers are me also members of groups. Um, but all of these are different relationships. Right, and we have a ton of relationships within large corporate environments. Um, at my company, we will do um, red teams on organizations with like Fortune 100 companies, and if you think about how many relationships are within those, that's when it starts getting a little bit dicey. Um, and and this quote is one of my favorite out of the books that I've read um, because I think it takes the the problems of Active Directory and it really. I mean, it, I'll just read the quote. Um, we do not need to be rational and scientific when it comes to the details of our daily life, only in those that can harm us and threaten our survival. So all of these relationships in Active Directory, we need them, but when they're harmful, we need to be able to identify them. And there are other talks. Um, there's one right after mine about Bloodhound that can, that can help show you how to identify those relationships. But just the knowledge of that and the knowledge of we need a certain amount of relationships, but the bad ones are really bad. That's what I'm going to be focusing on today. So if you want to actually start exploiting these relationships, my first advice is to go to Bloodhound, the doc that's right after mine. It's in track two. Um, so what this does is it reveals the hidden and often um, unintended relationships within an Active Directory environment. In this example right here, um, it's taking the user, um, I'm going to mess this up, S. Manser at local, at internal.local, um, and it's trying to find the path to domain admins, right? We want to see, we want to get a better understanding of all of the relationships within Active Directory to see how do we get from where we are to where we want to go, and what is a path of least resistance? Um, at SpectreOps, uh, we've seen companies with more than 55 million abusable relationships. Um, to put that into, to, to try to add context to that statement, I don't think I've ever counted to a thousand, ever. I don't think I've ever counted that high because it takes a long time. 50 mi 55 million, I've definitely never counted to a million. And I know that I've definitely never counted to 55 million. And that amount, it's like, uh, it's, it's hard to even comprehend how many abusable relationships there are when we, when we can't even contextualize what that number means. Right, so, so all of these different groups um, and all of these different computers and how it's all kind of intertwined, we need to start thinking about, okay, when we're creating these trust relationships, what does that mean, right? And what trust dependencies exist for each relationship? How, is, how are they assessed? Um, and the way that I did that was from um, Peter Kofta's um, 2012 Troopers talk about trust heuristics and, and how trust can be used to, um, and how basic trust fundamentals can apply to security topics. So I'm going to be applying this to Active Directory and, and Kerberos, but as a basic overview, um, I'll be covering consensus-based trust, knowledge-based trust, policy-based trust, control-based trust, and author authoritative trust. Um, and I think it's best to just dive right into it. Um, consensus-based trust, I trust you because everybody else seems to trust you. Well, why do companies use Active Directory? Um, 
It's known to have problem. It's known to, to have issues. But really, everybody uses Active Directory. If I think about the amount of Fortune 500 companies that don't use Active Directory, I can think of one off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a few others. But people look to their competitors, right? And they look to what is the industry standard. That's consensus-based trust, OK? And then for knowledge-based trust, um, I trust you because I know you, and I trust myself. Well. That's our own implementations of Active Directory. I think that Active Directory is pretty secure. There have been a few major issues um, that people like uh, Lee Christensen has, has come out with and has really disrupted how Active Directory works and problems within it. But overall, it has so much exposure that it's a pretty good system. The problem is, is when you start changing Active Directory, right? The problem is, is once you start making your modifications. And that's really the, the trust heuristic of overly trusting yourself. Every single Active Directory environment has its nuances. Um, for policy-based trust, I trust you because a policy says I should trust you. What immediately comes to mind is group policy, right? And, and how GPO, group policy objects, is implemented. Um, the first thing is just the very simple one of get, G, um, get G, GPP password. When passwords are just embedded into group policy, and that's an easy way to easy win right there. Um, but but something I find a lot more interesting is how group policy is actually being implemented, right? How is group policy getting pushed down, and and when is group policy being applied? And it's being applied by the last in, first out. Um, group policy can do everything, right? It can do everything for setting access controls. It, it can also do everything for exploiting different controls. And the problem is, is everything can't be top of mind. We can't have everything be the most important piece. And that's why we have different layers of how it's being done. And for group policy, it's last in, first out. But it gets really confusing for auditing. Um, I, I pulled these examples um, from Andy Robbins' blog. There's a reference down there. You can check it out once I release this. Um, but here are different examples of when group policy can be abused, right? So the first one, um, what, it, what an abuse is, you can add a new local admin account. Um, for the second one, you can grant a user the right to log on via RDP, um, SE debug, like change SE debug privilege, um, and all that stuff. And there's a lot of research by other people um, that have already been going into this, but what I want to point out is this is because we are trusting this policy. And should we, right? Should we be always trusting that policy? Um, there are unintended opportunities and consequences through tr trust inheritance. We need trust inheritance because we would never be able to make a decision, right? We wouldn't be able to um, topple things on top. We wouldn't be able to learn from each other and, and be able to advance um, security and, and scale it as, as quickly as possible. But there are definitely consequences. Um, one of, one of the, the kind of consequences is, is how Kerberos has been implemented and the exploitations within that. Um, a control-based trust, um, there is a control that enforces your behavior, and I trust this control. Um, what immediately came to mind for me was a Kerberos protocol. Do people in this room trust Kerberos? I don't know. It's it's a it's a MIT um, protocol that came out in the 1970s. And when we think about all of the different DerbyCon talks that have about, been about Kerberos and how it, it can be exploited, I'm sure people will start to question themselves. Um, I, I made a graphic here um, about how I think about the Kerberos trust pipeline. Um, so step one is authentication service sends a request to a domain controller. Um, step two, authentication service gets a reply from a DC that contains a um, ticket granting ticket, which is TGT. Um, if the authentication is successful, it gets in, um, encrypted, um, encoded by the, by the KRB TGT hash. And then step three, a TGT request is sent with the, um, sorry, uh, uh, it's, it's sent with the user's TGT. Um, and then for the TGS reply, okay, step four, a ticket granting um, service ticket is sent containing a service ticket. So that's moving really fast. We're, we'll have other slides about it. Um, but that's a very high level view. Um, so that's the protocol. And if you think about, okay, well, what dependencies on this protocol could be exploited? I think we can all think of some right off the top of our head. Um, golden ticket, um, silver ticket, 
uh, over past the hash, right? So then we get into the authoritative trust. The, the authority said that I can trust you, and I trust this, ator I trust this authority. PGTs and service tickets. Um, so here's another diagram, pretty similar, but here's what's actually being sent over, um, being, and then with a purpose and, and why. So the user hash is sent to a domain controller for the purpose of getting a TGT. And that TGT is encoded with a KRB TGT hash. And then um, once the, the validated user um, request access to a computer or its resource, um, the DC will send back a service ticket that is encoded with a server hash. And then that service ticket um, is sent with uh, is sent for authentication, right? So breaking down into this trust pipeline to see what part of the pipeline are we actually exploiting? Because to get actual authentication to a resource like um, a file share, you need to go through this entire process. And if you can compromise any part of the pipes, that means that, you know what, you, you've done it. You, you hacked it. Congratulations. Um, so for over past the hash, um, the, in this diagram, uh, what I'm trying to show is if you can compromise the user hash, you can get a TGT. That's awesome, right? And there's four different um, overall like encryption types. Uh, and, and usually you would be, want to be using AES-256 since it's the most normal, but often we'll use RC4. Um, and I mean, this, this is also called um, pass the key. If you want to actually go out and, and do over pass the hash um, and, and kind of use it in your environment, I would highly suggest the tool Rubius. Um, it was created by Will Schroeder. Um, I, I linked the GitHub here. I'm not going to go through um, how to use Rubius for, for the next two because um, I think the documentation online is, is, much more, is much better than what I could do myself. But this is how you would be taking advantage of the authoritative trust um, assumption and, and heuristic. In golden tickets, what's happening is you're using the KRB TGT to forge ticket granting tickets, right? So if you look at step number two, that's being sent over. If you can compromise that and you can get and you can um, forge your own TGTs, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, that, that's just awesome. And then for silver tickets, um, what's going on is since the TGT is only protected by the hash of the Kerberos um, ticket granting service KRB TGT, this hash, if this hash is compromised in any way, it can be forged, right? Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I, I was, okay, moving, moving forward. Um, the best part about a silver ticket is there's no traffic to the domain controller since it's harder to detect, but it's still, we have that authoritative trust that's being sent forward. Um, and, and what I want to really get across is for all of these different trust domains, Trust is contextual, right? So you need a uh, um, you need certain amount of um, context about the environment to know whether you can actually apply these different things. There might be uh, there might be different um, things that will hinder your way of being able to exploit this. We need to understand the environment um, when we are creating um, fake silver and golden tickets. We're really using real tickets and hashes to authenticate the resources. It's all based on real stuff that we trust. But with that, we can do malicious things. And, and what I would argue is that with a very strong narrative, we can create that context, right? We can create that contextual environment. What narratives do is they get in the way of our ability to think critically. Um, what first comes to mind for that is the um, illusory truth effect, right? And the illusory truth effect is when you keep on hearing the same thing over and over, and it changes your perception of stuff. Um, language is infectious. It's like a virus, and I like using the word virus because a virus goes viral, right? You can have a bacterial virus that goes around to all these different people. You can also have a computer virus that goes around to all these different computers, but it's something that is pervasive, not just in language, but across all the different domains. Um, I'm going to show a case study here where um, the, the synopsis was someone was asking to cut in front of other people during... Um, well, there's a long line uh, to make Xerox copies, and someone was trying to cut in front of other people. So in the first case, someone said, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use a Xerox machine? And 60% of people let that person cut in front of them. The second case was, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use a Xerox machine um, because I'm in a rush? And I want to add, this one added legitimate justification. 94% of people let that person cut in front of them. And the last one, excuse me, I have five pages, may I use a Xerox machine? 
because I have some copies to make. This added no justification. This added no argument. This, this added nothing except for more words, right? And, and actually 93% of people said, <laughs> um, said, you know what, that's fine, cut in front of me. But we can see that language, just adding more words, can shape the way that we think about reality, right? Um, our world is created, modified, and skewed with words. And that's really important when you think about how computers take on the biases of their owners, right? If computers take on the biases of their owners, then we can use narrative and context to be better red teamers. So let's kind of go back to the beginning and, and think about red team operations, okay? I, I, started this, I started this presentation saying that I'm a red team operator and I like my job because I get to take these high level concepts and then really apply them to, um, to my work. Um, so, so going through what a, what a day in the life is um, as a consultant at Specter Ops, the first thing um, I'm doing during a, a red team operation is I'm preparing for initial access, right? I don't have any access to the environment. I'm trying to think of creative ways to, to get in. Um, and I'm going to use examples from physicals and, and phishing campaigns. Um, but when I fish users, I need to set up realistic and probable campaigns. I need to leverage assumptions, um, and assumptions as you and me, it's, it's fantastic, um, to let a user create rationality behind that. Um, so, so the example from the behavioral science side I want to give, um, it, it's a pretty famous um, case study called the Linda problem. And if anyone here is named Linda, um, I apologize. My mother's name is named Linda. Um, but it's, it's just the name of the study. Um, so Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. So ask yourself, what is more likely, that Linda is a bank teller or that Linda is, more bank, is a bank teller and is active in the feminist heuristic? So the correct answer is one, Linda is a bank teller. Because if Linda was a bank teller and active in the feminist movement, that would be a broader circle, right? So this is a, an example of the conjunction fallacy, um, aka the probability of two events occurring um, is always going to be less than or equal to the probability of either one occurring alone. Um, when, this, when this study was done, 80% of respondents said the latter, said the, said the second one. And this is really impactful because the people in that study were um, graduate students at UC Berkeley studying behavioral science. They were, they were regular mom and, top, uh, mom and pop type people, but still everyone chose the more, um, not the more probable one, but the more plausible option. Right, it makes more sense for Linda to be in the second group instead of the first group, and and we have a, a huge confusion between plausibility and probability. Um, so then, when we start, oh, <laughs> uh, so so to summarize um, the representativeness heuristic, um, kind of in full, that when when judging a new event, people will pay um, more attention to the degree of similarity to other events than the actual probability. Um, so then. When we think about, okay, how do I want to better fish a user? We need very plausible fishing events. And we also want really interesting fishing events. You can make anything interesting. Um, and, and the way that you make people, what, the way that you avoid kind of getting put into the people won't click my, my link is by making yourself not a villain. And people have a tendency to manufacture villains all over the place. But when we ask ourselves, who are the villains? The answer is the, the villains are people that are not like us or people that we know or people that we comprehend. The villains are kind of the others, right? Um, I, I was really surprised. I, I took a trip over to Tokyo and I'm standing there in the airport and I kind of have this um, resting confused face and I was confused. I had no idea where to go. Um, and a group of British girls came up to me and, and they were asking for directions because they could tell I was also confused. A few minutes later, uh, um, a Japanese man who had been standing there the entire time understood English. He came over and told us how to get to where we need to go. It makes zero sense why the, the girls approached me and not the actual local, right? Because I don't know what's going on. And, and when I travel abroad, I find that usually it's uh, Canadians, Australians, people from the UK that are asking for my recommendations instead of asking for the local um recommendations because people are, are more trusting of people that they recognize. And that's crazy. So then when we start thinking about 
who do we want to fish or how do we want to break into a building? We gotta, we gotta take who we are and create that context by, by acting, right? And finding our inner threat actor. Um, and, and the goal for that is to create, um, plausibility for things that might occur, right? Um, and I, I, I personally love finding my inner threat actor. So when I think about who I am, I need to think about who do people think I am? There are certain things like my DNA or my genes um, that I can't change. I'm, I'm 24 years old. My skin color is a certain way. My hair is this, I guess I could cut my hair. Um, but there's certain characteristics that I can't get away from, like my ancestral history. These are, these are set in stone. But things like jeans, which I'm not wearing today because no pants are the best pants. Um, jeans, uh, the, the clothing, I can, I can change, right? I can create plausibility based on what I'm wearing. So during a physical test, um, I can, I can change my clothes and have people perceive me differently. And this is tested in, um, Ubers. Ubers are the best place to test physical appearances. So if I wear jeans, I can look like an intern. If I wear, um, just regular kind of business clothes, I can be an accountant. And if I wear high heels and a dress, I can be an attorney. Um, and, and the reason why I picked these roles are these are all roles I've been in the past, right? I've, I've been an intern. I've been an accountant. Um, and I've, I've been a GDPR consultant. Um, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to fish myself, right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to fish people like me because I know I would trust me, right? Like I think of myself as a trustworthy person. Um, so then I think about who I was. And what, if I'm an intern, I was doing checklists all the time of how is your internship experience? I'm sending accountant spreadsheets. Accountants love spreadsheets and macros. I can not get that point across enough. Um, as a GDPR consultant, I remember what was really Im impactful when we were dealing with clients and sending them, oh my gosh, you guys, you, you just had this really bad, um, you have like a lawsuit coming up and, and creating these stories based off stuff that I know is true, right? I'm fishing people just like me and I'm taking my background to go better that. So, Let's say I, I, I get, I fish someone. Um, I have initial access and I, I got to use it with limited privileges. So then what can I do? Well, I, I don't want to just start running crazy PowerShell all over the place. I want to get a better idea of what's actually going on. I don't want to be loud. Uh, I might browse some file shares and, and find out um, kind of what's on there. I, I might get access to their email if I'm lucky. Um, maybe I'll set persistence. Um, but but really what I want to start thinking about is prospect theory, right? I want to think about the risks that I'm willing to take to go better this stuff, right? Because from the outside the environment, I have, I, there's not that much risk. There's, I can't get lower than outside the environment. But once I'm inside and I'm starting to get a little bit riskier, I need to think about, I could lose access and I don't want to do that. I need to be a little bit more stealthier. And as the, the project progresses and as time progresses, I need to take prospect theory and start applying that to my red team operations of, okay, I, I, I keep on moving forward. I need to get, I need to be more and more cautious because I have more and more to lose. Um, and so humanity tends to focus on known variables and we underestimate the impact of chance and chaos in environments. So when I first start looking at, okay, what do I actually want to exploit? What do I actually want to go after? It's, I want to go after things that maybe not everyone has looked at. What I don't want to do is go look at Microsoft signed tools. I don't want to go look at Microsoft stuff because those are usually pretty hardened. Uh, I want to go target customi customization and fragility in said environments. Um, so I, I'm going back to Seatbelt as a way to identify fragility. Um, they created a module um, where they're looking for non-standard Microsoft processes and non-standard services um, to find ways that maybe you can backdoor an executable with the NSPY or, or something along those lines, right? But we're looking for things that haven't been looked at by nearly as many people as these, uh, these services. So let's say from there, um, I'm able to get a valid local admin credential. What, what can and what can't I do? Um, so the first thing I'm going to want to do is go through those situational awareness checks again. And I want to see, okay, now do I have any more insight? Because more information is valuable without creating too much noise. Um, and, and maybe I can go log into other machines and see what's running there. But before I move forward, I need to start understanding the context of, okay, what user did I compromise? And I mean, at, at what level? Um, so, so going back to the physical example of, as an intern, 
I have low privileges, but I, I can do a lot of stuff, right? I can go walk up to people. And I can go ask them, hey, um, I need directions, and maybe I'll clone their badge. And, but as an attorney, um, I can't really go around asking for directions because it doesn't make that much sense. As an attorney, I would go and say, hey, I need you to plug in this USB drive, or uh, our company's going to go bankrupt, right? It's taking that context and being able to better apply it. Um, and then for understanding context and privileges within, um, within processes, there, we have, we have low integrity, medium integrity, and high integrity. And this, this is really important for deciding what we can and what we can't do, right? Um, so for, for uh, a medium integrity process, we want to, we, we'll get a, a UI approval prompt. And that's something that we don't want to, that we don't want to do. We want to move into a, a high integrity process by doing things like making tokens and um, moving that way so that we can interact with um, LSAS and other restricted actions. But it's still taking that overall concept of context and saying, okay, we can see this and we can better understand it and what to go after if we understand what context is and what context isn't. Um, so one one um, concept that I, I really enjoy is red team analytics. And it's, a point, it's um, employing tradecraft that will give the best appearance of blending in uh, with what you determine to be the most noise prone events. So noise and, and bias are pretty different. Um, people are aware of noise, but they really underestimate the impact of what it has. So um, there is a study done where people think that 10% uh, of, of the events that they're taking in is noise, where really it was 50%, and that's crazy. So when we're, when we're trying to go uh, move around a network, we want to blend in with the noisy because system administrators are also underestimating the impact that noise has. Um, and then there's the caveat of, of you don't want to do stuff that will get you caught, right? You want to, you don't want to do known malicious noise prone events. And that's, that's just moving along with the, the constant cycle of, um, the red team gets better, the blue team gets better. But finding those noise prone activities, um, and kind of living off the land, right? That concept of what do people, what are people doing every day? We want to use that in addition to our context, right? We want to improve our context by living off the land and following noise prone activities. Um, so I created this slide um, for more to think about how the, the incident response team is thinking about um, everything. So with more experience, we can better predict outcomes with less information. And because of that, the perception of normality and context is created through experience in the field. So if we are trying to, to, to tie into those noise prone events, or we're trying to tie into alerts that we know that um, the security operations team is getting all the time, they're more likely to overlook them, right? Um, my first job, I, I was doing level one and two responding uh, for, for a, a large company. And at some point, um, one of my seniors and, or managers told me, hey, uh, you know what? You don't have to worry about this alert, right? This alert, it, it's popping up every day. Just don't worry about it. Those are the types of events that I want to blend into, right? I want to take advantage of all this experience and knowledge that incident responders have really have, have surmised over their, over their years. Um, and I think that this is also where kind of the, the perpetual beginners, like myself, um, really thrive because we don't understand what these rules mean. We don't have the context yet. We don't have the experience. And we're going, and we do a deeper dive as to what's actually going on. Um, so at the bottom, a new experience happens, our brain indexes that event, and now we have an adjusted and overconfident understanding of the world. We can only see what we see, and the real, the real impactful stuff is what we don't see, right, is what's not there. So if you think about um, uh, looking for antivirus, if we see that a, a certain um, EDR product is there, is that as important as knowing that no um, EDR product is there. I mean, you decide there's um, a lot of ways to go about that. Um, and then moving forward with this overall red team um, attack path, now I'm running as a high privilege user. That's awesome. Um, what can I do? Um, and, and that's kind of, now I can touch LSAT, so I'll, I'll start doing that, um, that, that process. Um, what I used to do was run proc dump. That was like my first assess, my first red team. I ran proc dump about 60 times and it was awesome. It was 2017 and it was not getting flagged. But now pretty much everyone knows it's probably bad. Um, the sysinternals toolkit, questionable. It could be used 
or it could be bad. But it depends on the context. So why is proc dump bad? It's bad because it touches LSAS. And if you look at what Mimikatz is doing, and if you look at everything under the hood of, of why things are actually bad, we get a better understanding of, OK, how can we go take this and manipulate it a little bit to go do other bad things? Um, so if I took something like proc dump, and for this example, I just used seatbelts again, and all I did was change the names, right? I, I changed it to um, Cinturon, just my, my great Spanish coming out. Um, but just obfuscating a little bit. If, that, if, if seatbelt gets alerted and this doesn't, that's bad. Um, and what teams on both the offensive and the defensive need to do is focus on the overall behavior. You want to focus on the overall context and not just the tools and signatures, right? That's how we make for, for better, for better um, red teamers. That's how we make better blue teamers. We want to focus on behavior and context and not just the, the, the hard indicators. Um, so let's say part five, um, I compromise the credentials of a domain admin. What can't I do? Um, this is something that I've done on, a, on and off when I was very tired. Not a great, not a great career moment. Um, but I started browsing some file shares. I was just thinking, oh, whatever. Um, and of course that gets caught. Um, because domain admins don't browse file shares, right? Especially in uh, like a, as a high privilege user, they're like, um, they're like the C-level executive going around and asking for directions around a building. That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, they're, they're the most watched users, and we need to take that context and apply that to, OK, maybe this would, this would work if I was running in a medium integrity or even a low integrity process, but definitely not a high one. Um, and and to, to kind of summarize this entire presentation, because I know We've gone through a, a lot of different topics, and we've moved them through them very quickly. Um, what I really want to get across to you is that computers take on the biases of, of their owners, right? And, and I want you to question, what does that mean for security? Um, and that we can learn from other fields, um, like behavioral science, and, and even not just behavioral science, that's just my interest. Whatever your interests are, go out and see what you can apply to information security and see if you can go learn something from that, right? Because certain themes are pervasive across domains. Um, and the security industry is really good at identifying patterns, but identifying patterns can lead to overconfidence, right? If you see a pattern, you're like, okay, this is a pattern, um, and now we're only going to go look for this, you leave yourself open to vulnerability. So instead, I, I hope that you all encourage skepticism in the way that you're currently doing things, right? Um, instead of just using tools to go to go out and execute and go out and 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 do that, be ask yourself why, right? Like, why is this actually happening? Why is this making sense? Um, because because being skeptical is, is is a way to advance your career, and also um, it's a way to move things forward. Um, also, encouraging the learning mindset of even people that have been in this field for 20 years have things to learn from the noobs. Um, and it's, it's constantly trying to, to get better. Um, the, the same way that cognitive kindness and ways to make decisions really easy for ourselves can also be computational kindness, right? And ways to make um, decisions easier for an incident response team or a red team, right? Leveraging tools like seatbelt. Um, and then we should beware of overconfidence and also simplification, right? Things are complex. Things are difficult. Things are hard. If we oversimplify them, we're going to become overconfident in them. And that's where I think being an expert gets in the way of our drive, of, of our way to really seek out the truth. Um, we can't afford to rely on fragile perspectives, like setting ceilings and rational thinking. We really need to think about, OK, what's actually going on? Um, security is hard. Uh, also, we should be aware of narratives, especially Personal narratives. Oh, that's a little backwards. Um, personal narratives, because we are a lot more than who we define ourselves as, right? Like if I'm, if I think about how I break into a building and looking at how other people perceive me, I also need to look at how I perceive me and break down that narrative and really push myself forward in my research and also um, the way that I interact with people. And I think the most important one is beware of metaphors. Metaphors are um, behavioral shortcuts. Metaphors and, and analogies are ways to simplify things, and oversimplification is bad, right? So when we're using metaphors, what we're doing is creating mental shortcuts, and we're just simplifying. Security is complex, um, and, and we should always try to encourage rational thinking. Um, 
I don't know if I have time for, for questions, but, um, oh, I don't. So if you, <laughs> so, um, if you have any, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me after. Um, I, yeah, my contact information's there and I'll be around the conference, but thank you very much for attending.